Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Grace Whiting, the President and CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, a caregiving organization that's based in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America. I am beyond excited to introduce our panels today and to tell you about day four of the World Carers Conversation, a virtual summit on the state of caregiving in the era of COVID-19. As we have our conversation today, we invite you to share your thoughts and questions in the chat box, which is labeled Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also listen or follow along by reading the transcript by clicking the box that says closed captioning. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook, we invite you to comment, share, and engage in discussion with others who may be watching this live. And finally, just by way of housekeeping, this presentation will be recorded and will be shared on the National Alliance for Caregiving website so that you can come back and learn more about it, watch it again, or read the distinguished biographies of the wonderful speakers that we've had this week. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what today's program will entail. And I am very excited as we've had thus far conversations, including our opening musical reception. We've had our day two of a summit which focused on caregiving in the Americas with perspectives from Canada, the United States, Mexico, Brazil, and various other countries in Central and Latin America. On the following day of the summit, yesterday, we had presentations on the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, featuring perspectives from global leaders such as Euro Carers, and the World Dementia Council, in addition to perspectives of those working on caregiving, aging, and disability issues in countries such as Ghana, Nambia, Israel, the United Kingdom, France, Ireland, and others. And today we are wrapping up the conversation around the globe. We'll start with a fireside chat discussing global trends and the state of the state in India. We'll then move on to a panel discussing caregiving in Asia with a special focus on caregiving in China, Japan, and South Korea. Then we'll hear from the lived experience of a caregiver who is living in Japan and what her, her life has been like in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, we will wrap discussion by talking about caregiving in the South Pacific with perspectives from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Australia, and New Zealand. As always, this is an ongoing and evolving national conversation. And I want to thank all of you for being engaged in this discussion, particularly because in the United States, we are looking to our global partners for leadership and to better understand how we can weather this pandemic and whatever may come out ahead. So with that, I wanna go ahead and get us started. You'll see on your screen that we have shared a poll and invited you to participate. And we will um, go ahead and end the poll now, and then we'll launch it again after this presentation when we get to the break so that you can have a chance to weigh in if you haven't already. And it's exciting to see that we have people from all over the world, including the USA, um, Japan and South Korea, Australia and other nations. And that for many families, much as it was in the first two days of our summit, people are beginning to feel or have been feeling increased stress and anxiety among their family members, as well as financial challenges and challenges with living and working and learning remotely. So with that in mind, I wanna introduce you to two of my colleagues um, who will be kicking us off for our, for our evening fireside chat. And the first is Dr. K.R. Gangahadran, 
who is the founder of India's premier private geriatric healthcare facility, Heritage Medical Center, which was founded in 1994 in Hyderabad, India. Following that as a family business, he set up two units of Kestra and one unit of Keshlayam. He has been involved with the government of India's Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment and has worked on the formulation of, of the national policy on older persons in 1999 and its review in, 2010, in 20, 2010. He has served the country's highest body, the National Council of Older Persons, during 2006 to 2011 and was appointed by the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. I would also mention that as a colleague, he has been a leader in global coalitions and has led a number of conversations with other leaders around the world, particularly in light of COVID-19, to help us better understand what solutions we can find for those who are aging, who may be living in nursing facilities, and for the friends and family who might be caring for them. I am also excited and overjoyed to present to you Jasmine Greenemeyer. Jasmine is a partner for this global summit and her company, um, EMD Serrano, as it's called in the US, and Merck KJA Darmstadt, Germany, as it is called outside of the US, is a partner and a sponsor for this wonderful global event. Jasmine serves as the vice president and head of global strategic partnerships. There she oversees global initiatives, including both the Embracing Carers Global Initiative and the initiative known as Healthy Women, Healthy Economies. This is a natural transition for Jasmine who previously worked at the same company as the Senior Director of Patient Advocacy and Strategic Partnerships for Oncology and Fertility. Her experience spans work in the national and community public health, particularly working to increase early detection for the treatment of cancer. She has worked with global partners to advocate for women and for caregivers and to help families reach their full economic potential by improving health outcomes and giving them resources to help their health journey no matter what stage in life. Prior to joining Merck KJA, Jasmine worked at the Colorectal Cancer Alliance for eight years and for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Department of Education, and the U.S. National Institutes for Health. So I am very honored to invite um, both Genga and Jasmine um, to, to kick us off with a fireside chat and discussion. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much. Well, Genga, let's just begin our fireside chat. Uh, first of all, I have to thank you for uh, joining us today to have this conversation, particularly around the unmet needs and opportunities in the Asian Pacific region. And uh, you're immensely well-respected in this arena. And in, in fact, uh, Grace and I's colleague, uh, Anil from World Cares, wanted, uh, Cares Worldwide, excuse me, wanted to say a warm hello to you on um, our behalf. So I wanted to talk about your immense contributions in the field, but I thought first we should set the stage about India specifically. I mean, India is the second largest country, right? It has a, a very seismic aging population and the difference between rural and rural areas is immense, right? Um, can you comment on the unique demographics of India and what this means uh, for trying to address the needs of unpaid caregivers? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Jasmine, uh, for setting this uh, morning motion. And uh, thank um, uh, Family Caregivers Alliance Grace and uh, Charlotte for uh, you know, making this happen this evening for you and uh, day for all of us. Yes, I think uh, the world is, uh, you know, 20 years ago in India, we never thought we are all getting old. We never even 
acknowledge the fact that there was something called aging. When I got into the field on aging in 94, there were hardly anybody talking about older population. So yes, it's changed alarmingly now. We have crossed 100 and plus million population over 60 years. Because in India, we keep 60 as the age of old, not 65, which a lot of other countries. I think uh, for, for a very you know, unique reason, in 1999, the government of India announced a policy on aging. It's called National Policy on Older Persons. I think that set the motion on, on the communities getting aware there's something called old age, there's something called aged population, and what's happening around the world. Till then, this was not commonly known uh, fact, and not many people were discussing. Now, very interestingly, there has been a lot of studies that have been conducted on aging since then. One of the important uh, studies was in, carried out by the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, India. I think one of the largest studies that has been conducted in India was uh, during 2009 to 2011. And uh, I happened to be part of that group, not as a researcher, but not as an advisor to the group of UNFPA, India. And very revealing facts that we came to know about that. What it really means in terms of families, what it means in terms of aging population. And this population study was primarily done in uh, covering both rural and uh, urban population, mm -hmm. where in India, practically 75% of the older people live in rural areas where, you know, uh, it's not well structured and not the infrastructure is not so well developed, though in the last 15, 20 years time, things have improved a lot. And uh, despite all that, healthcare is still sought out in major cities. I'm not talking about the metro cities like, you know, Mumbai, Delhi, and, you know, other places, but smaller cities, it's all being accessed. I think the aging population is now able to have better access. I think this is one of the biggest challenge that we have seen is healthcare. In terms of older population in a country like India, when you go by the basics of I call, uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy theory of needs. Basic food is the basic thing, and followed by shelter and then healthcare. Rest of the things come later. I think at this point of time, the people in the urban rural areas are more focused on food and shelter. I think for the first time, the country came to know in the last 15 years, 20 years of time, there is something called, you know, the rural population, which are not getting adequate attention in respect of uh, old population because they have no access to practically everything, very little access to it. So the government of India came out of the again, again, programs, which probably I'll discuss it if, you know, there is a need for it. I think the, the aging population has gained a lot of importance. No, I don't, th I think for the first time, the, if you're talking about caregiving in India, mm -hmm. it's been always out of pocket. And uh, we don't have schemes that are available extensively in India where, you know, programs and schemes are continuing there. There are no major service providers. People like us who provide services are for people who can afford. I think you must have heard, you know, something called uh, great Indian middle class. Mm -hmm. So probably we are catering to the needs of those, you know, probably 150, 200 millions of people in the country. But for the first time, it is a truth and for the first time, people started understanding what caregiving during this pandemic. I think there is a lot, I think this pandemic, uh, more than creating a lot of havoc among a lot of people, it's also created a lot of awareness. I think people have come to know there is something called caregiving. I think this is a situation where you have, you know, mothers looking after the kids in the school when they are having a virtual class. They also need to work if they are working mothers. They also have to look after some old people at home if they have father or mother or, you know, someone. I think this is where the situation is taking place. Yeah. So thank you for that. But I'm also thinking of you know how large the um, elderly population is in India, right? Um, and I want to come back to that and just circling as you know within your specific country. And I think others will be able to speak to this as well. But you know how the scale, right, of caring for elderly in India um, is there lessons learned for other regions? as India has had to tackle this? Well, I think the 19, uh, uh, 2011 census, uh, you know, mentioned that India has a population of 103 million 60 plus. 
population. As I mentioned earlier, when you look at the studies, you find practically caregiving is not recognized. Mm. I don't think there is anybody recognizing caregiving. When the caregiving became an issue to the below poverty line people, which we say $1.5 a day for a family, mm. when, mm. It, when it, it, it's absolutely meager and it's nothing to you know, even survive. But if that was a basis on which we go about it, I think practically the abuse became an order of the day. Abuse of the elderly because they, the children don't know how to look after them because they don't have money to look after them. Uh, so. I think that's one of the biggest challenge that country faces in respect to people who are poor. Unfortunately, according to the data available with us in India, 75% of the population of 60 plus live in rural areas and 75% of the older population are also living below poverty line. Which means they are living in poverty. These are the two major things that happens. People like us who serve the society altogether different, probably we are not even addressing 1% of the country's needs of talking about 1 million senior citizens being looked after. So that's a major challenge that you have. Now, caregiving, if you're talking about the statistics of elder abuse, I think which is directly related to the inability to care for the older persons at home, it's for two major reasons. Now, two reasons. Number one is the number of children given birth by the parents, those days were three or four or six or eight, which has now changed to 1.5 to two you know, per family. So the whole thing mm -hmm. has changed now over a period of time. And people who gave birth to so many children, they, they were not able to fend for themselves. So when the old person started living longer, see in 1990s, the longevity of India was hardly 52 years. But today it is 67 years. Right. So in average, 67 years, a huge number. And there are two important statistics in this. The 60 plus population is growing at 300%, mm -hmm. while 80 plus population is growing at 600%. So which means people are living healthier life. They have adopted right. healthy lifestyles. And they are living better because we didn't have a corporate health care that we are having today. It's the 1980s when you know, corporate healthcare became an uh, important uh, industrial revolution in the country. More people started adopting both preventive care as well as curative care. That means people could undergo you know, open heart surgeries, which they were not going through in 1980s. So the longevity is increased. The families do not know how to cope with the longevity. I think if you really look at the middle class today, they've adopted it so beautifully. I think there are a lot of, you know, you know, therapy is going on, meditation going on, yoga going on, physical exercise going on. The whole culture has changed. In yep. the case of the poorer rural population, also things have improved a lot. So some system challenges there. I want to yeah. switch gears a little bit and come back to, you know, you having created this medical facility, right? Um, when you think of healthcare institutions, what do you think they specifically can do to better support carers and their families? Okay, now we are, we, are, we are actually running this from 94, which is 26 years. We are running the 27th year. It's a fabulous experience for us, sometimes very stressful uh, because uh, we are not able to always meet the exact needs of the families because uh, a lot of our uh, people live outside India, the family members, and the old people are here. They're not willing to go out of their own country. So the biggest challenge that we have is People who are living outside, let's say, for example, a lot of children live in USA from India. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest problem that we encounter as the caregiver and the service provider, we are a service provider, is a huge level of guilt. Mm -hmm. So when the guilt comes in, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of, you know, one day they are very happy with the services that we give, very next day saying, you know, we are not giving good service. I think that's one of the biggest problems they have because we are unable to balance between the actual caregiving and the emotional needs of the elderly, uh, people of caregivers. If the caregiver is in India and they're living in the same city, let us say in the care of an institution like ours, they come and meet us, they understand what is happening and they go back satisfied, this is the best that we can give. That's one case. But if you look at the carers, I think we have been having a lot of deliberation in the last six months time about what is happening to carers but there is no organized method of discussing these carers forums in this country. 
just two days ago we had a you know meeting of this you know what is called the the state of telangana had convened a meeting of people who are working with uh, you know elderly and disabled very interesting thing there you understand carers are really struggling particularly during the covid time because right. they are they are all in the same building they are all not able to go out of the four walls a lot of frustrations i see your face all the time and you see my face all the time and we are seeing the you know the same faces all the time because there is no time for going out and meeting i think the virtual platforms are changing the trend now slowly but not all can afford to have a computer not all people can afford right. to have this kind of a conversation and network connections and you know wifi connectivity and things like that i think that's one of the biggest problem but one thing i can tell you what we have seen is when people are looking for a particular kind of service and there are service providers meeting those needs it's really good but let me tell you as far as the poor people are concerned the government of india has come out with a lot of policies huge number of policies earlier 20s 1990s and 2000 we used to get frustrated with the government for not doing it but let me tell you over a period of time budget allocations have been constantly increasing i think today we have gone beyond national policy of uh, older person in 1999 to the maintenance act and today to the national action plan for senior citizens 2025 so i think we are just moving ahead with that i think there could be a lot of relief for the caregivers to look at the options available to them to take care of the elderly persons particularly well it's interesting what you're talking about with um the challenges that we've seen with covid in caregivers and technology and i want to come back to that for a second um part of why you know grace pull we partnered with grace on this uh world carers conversation is that uh this past september we conducted a 12 country survey and we did have some countries from the greater asia pacific region right uh india was one of those china taiwan and also australia and what was really interesting we looked at apex specifically i think this may surprise you um the highest number of people who became carers for the first time were in india and it was 40% um but also what we saw was that in asian countries and obviously including india um they had the highest level of they felt very connected to others in receiving uh support compared to other parts of the world so maybe that doesn't surprise you but that was you know just an interesting finding for us as we looked at you know the contrast of um uh, eu countries and north america and such but when it came to technology um this is where india came up with the highest desire for greater guidance on telehealth technologies to provide care and i just wondered as you know a founder again of a healthcare system and as you you know navigated um also health policy it just what your thoughts are on how we can better address this need of technology in the asian pacific region particularly in india yes i think uh, uh, this uh, you know survey that we conducted is you know very nice because i have never known that a survey like this was conducted in india very nice uh, you know reference that you made and uh, yeah very happy to know that people are recognizing but let me tell you they may probably experience this for the first time because they are all now living in the same you know household you know they are all living in the same building but they have been taking care of them if you really look at uh, the historically care giving for a older person or for the matter disabled person as always and it continues to remain a family function family role rather right right uh, if you if i have a brother who is 69 years who is not mentally all right i look at him at home and so if you really look at it every family will have somebody who is either disabled or very very old mm -hmm. so i can give you any number of cases to say that it's a family function perhaps when you go for a survey for the first time they start realizing there is a role for them called caregiving <laughs> other they just been providing if you ask a lady at home in a in a domestic uh, woman at home they will say we are looking after my father in law my mother in law my father my aunt and things like that i think very nice that you people by doing this survey brought an awareness thank you very much for that now in respect of technology yes it has come to stay today it has become a part of thing you know uh, just 4 days ago we had a nice uh, you know virtual conference with some people living outside india children living outside india and with old people there very surprising to find 
highly educated people are not familiar with how to use a computer how to use a you know for the kind of a, a question but all of them are telling they have learned it now so if i want anything i don't go to the doctor actually my wife had a fall about 4 months ago she had a you know a fracture of her disc mm-hmm. let me tell you she had to be taken to an mri you know physically after that the doctor never came to see her it was all shared in the you know uh, on a you know computer or a telephone so doctor was one of the doctors who was treating her is little over 85 years and he says is very happy don't have to come don't bring her she'll struggle so i think tele health has become an important thing but i remember probably 25 years ago i was in boston in jocelyn diabetes center when they are talking about telemedicine across right. how they are doing surgery right. cataract surgeries but let me tell you india has been doing it for a very very long time in the rural areas yeah i wonder i think yeah it is very much i think it's not something new at least when you know former president abdul kalam was the president when he was working for a technology company he promoted telemedicine 30 years ago but the people have become aware of it because of necessity and i can tell you this is going to be the order of the day old people doesn't have to go and wait outside the physician throes yeah. something very interesting we are all very delighted about it. and we provide it let me tell you we provide it we reach out to people any time people cannot come we re- go there wherever tele consultation is possible without having to be physically examined by a doctor we give good services there good response there there could be some you know uh, some errors could be always there in diagnosis for the simple reason i i present a sim- symptoms is a major issue that's all yeah i think it's a definitely a good triage element i would say it shouldn't replace it all together but definitely it jump starts the conversation or helps with surveillance right and maintenance but Uh Grace here I want to pause and see what questions we wanted to pull through uh from our participants. Yeah. Absolutely. So um this is a very interesting question from one of the guests who's listening in. And the question is is there um an expat community of people who have chosen India for their retirement needs? some people who have moved to india to live in an assisted living facility or nursing homes or is the intergenerational care of elders predominant in the culture and less of a presence of revenue based elder care okay the ex- thank you grace for uh, referring that question number first one is there are not many expats who have moved in for care here not at this point of time i would say practically zero now coming to in terms of intergenerational caring it remains the backbone the study that was conducted in 19 uh, sorry 2011 by the unfpa is a very clear indication that only 5 to 6% of the people live in this country alone 95% of the people live with the old people live with the families so it's family it is family bound and when it is family bound in a rural area it is neighbor bound as well it is not you know the father son and all on take care of the neighbors come to assist they will make food for them somebody will go and you know you know one one gentleman was telling me beautifully when a old man falls sick there are 20 other neighbors who escort him to the hospital because they care so much so i think that's the kind of a neighborhood that you're talking about that's a question in fact uh, you know jasmine was referring to that's that's india's culture now in terms of economics of the elderly i think new companies new incorp- companies are being incorporated for profit companies are being incorporated we are one of them and uh, i think companies are coming to stay i think few companies at least few one of those gentlemen who is leading one of the india's uh, retirement communities is an american citizen who lives in uh, you know one part of north india he has come here you know he is being appointed as a ceo that he manages it so we have to see whether it takes a big shape because as long as there a family family care is there people may not resort to old age homes what we call old age homes in india or senior care homes it it may not be really sought i think that 5 to 6% people living alone will continue to live insignificant number of them alone will go to a retirement community or a old age home but we have to see whether it's going to take a big shape but it's taken a very slow progress in our case we take care of only health care of the elderly so therefore the demand for is limited only to people who are sick they come to us 
not otherwise. So uh, another question is um, one of our listeners wants to know more about the study, uh, Ganga, that you quoted from 2011. And I'm wondering um, if you would be able to share that either in um, the chat box or if you want to direct us and we'll, we'll post it for our listeners. I should be able to happily do that for you. I said, I will just write the study. They should be able to get it. I'm putting it in the chat box. They should be very happy to do that. And then the question is Paul's chat. Now it's called a building knowledge base, building knowledge base on population aging in India. Building knowledge base of population aging in India, BKPA. I'll write down as I talk to you. Wonderful. I'm wondering uh, a question that we've asked all, all of our panels uh, over the course of the week. Um, Jasmine, and maybe we can start with you, but you know, one of the most challenging things as we enter this, um, the winter where in many countries, the weather is getting much colder is um, the risk of reinfection. And I think some families are feeling um, some challenges related to they're feeling um, discouraged. And so I'm wondering what efforts have, you know, have you found to be helpful as you're sort of looking at your global partners um, to, to be, to address some of that discouragement? I think one of the most important components um, Ganga actually alluded to as well around mental health and well-being, right? That we, you know, caregivers are not feel like they don't have time to set aside time, right, to talk to someone. But going back to either in your immediate circle, seeing if there's someone that you just feel either comfortable venting with, or you know, having a hobby, or just trying to have some other space, right, some kind of creative outlet, um, or to be able to triage, like, hey, can you sit with my loved one while I go for a walk for 15, 20 minutes? Um, you know, it's from that immediate circle to maybe it needs, you know, a professional outlet. And if there's some way that you can either do telehealth appointments that way, so you don't have to physically go somewhere, but we're just really, that was one of the things that was really stark and consistent across all the regions. When we looked at the survey was how many close to about 75% to 80% of carers expressing that they just feel burnt out right now. And that was in September. <laughs> so to your point, um, we're only getting in the darker months um, in the more isolating months. So I, all I'm trying to say is I think we really need to encourage carers to um, make some time for themselves to connect with either some other loved ones or connect with someone professionally um, to think about some resources for themselves right now. Um, I have another question for um, Ganga, uh, which I think is, this is sort of a fascinating, uh, it's a challenge we have in the US all the time, but the question is, um, would you say that this multi-generational home arrangement helps to reduce ageism um, with families in India? Um, because I, you know, in the, in the United States, we're a very youth-focused culture. Uh, as far as I am concerned, it, it does help. I think multi-generational, if you ask me in my family, we have three generations living. I have my sister-in-law where there are four generations living. They're all living. My mother-in-law is 86 years. Now, industry, just understand at 86, last year she obtained her PhD. So which means at 85, she could pursue, please understand, She's setting a beautiful trend in the family. Age is not a bar for learning and to obtain a PhD. I think this is something phenomenal. Now, where the problem has come in, in, in terms of abuse, not all families abuse, but families which are able, unable to support the older persons by virtue of one, when there is a health problems. That's one major thing that comes in. I think the second major problem that comes in is when there is a daughter-in-law, mother-in-law conflict that comes in. Those are the two things that really happens because 90% of the time we have seen in the rural areas, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law phenomena is remaining a big force. 
now wherever the relationships are you know manageable they live together otherwise the old people are forced to leave there are definitely cases of physical abuse violent abuse and being thrown away from the home now if i one is sympathy other aspect is adaptability i also believe it is not for the adults alone to adapt to the changing situations older people are equally responsible to change their attitude towards the society and the families so the family needs are also changing children are not particularly in the last 6 months of time i can tell you i see two of my daughters at home they are so stressed because morning the the child goes to the school they have to be in the virtual class with the the school 3 hours 4 hours they are sitting in the school they are not able to do any other work there is a phone call from the hospital can you do this she cannot attend to the call because she is attending the class i think the pressure on this will or by now, most often can lead to abuse so ageism will come in but i would say there are studies to say there are one set of reports which are says very high level of abuse if you go by the you know the study that we have done in bk you know unfpa that i was quoting only in one or two states the studies are reported very high whereas rest of the places is very low and when you go and visit the old age homes you realize where it is high and where it is low it is true that those two three states are even able to tell there is an abuse maybe old people may not want to tell for if you talking about the legislation that india has passed not many people have gone to the courts to get any respite they continue to you know struggle and cope with the typical problem that they face with the families thank you thank you and i so jasmine and ranga i think we are at the end of our fireside chat and i you know i just want to say how wonderful it is to be able to um have morning coffee and evening coffee at the same time um mm -hmm. and to be able to share just these wonderful insights to kick off today's conversation so thank you thank you both so much um very wonderful very happy to have you here so um, great show you have done a great job thank you so much for calling me very nice jasmine being very patiently moderating this session in the you know for me early morning thank, thank you thank you cheers thank you grace once again for inviting me thanks oh of course so um i'm very excited to introduce our next panel um which includes colleagues that we have met through a number of global coalition bodies including the embracing carers initiative um the international alliance of care organizations and also um groups such as the gerontological society of america which has um global meetings on research around the world um through groups like iagg so today we're going to hear first from my colleague um zizi zong who is the executive director of shanghai roots and shoots which is a china government registered nonprofit organization She actually started at Roots and Shoots as a high school intern and was one of the first staff members there. And they work closely with 400 schools, kindergarten to university, and thousands of volunteers in and around Shanghai. In addition to environmental education and organic gardening programs, their long-standing programs include the Million Tree Project, which is now nearing planting of millions of trees. um in areas of inner mongolia and other areas um that need to have trees be replanted she's worked on health and nutritional education and services for thousands of migrant working children a pioneering program to provide social services to cancer patients and their families among others she is also um in in this work with shanghai roots and shoots the work has been recognized globally as part of the climate change video that opened the 2016 Rio Olympics and first lady Michelle Obama in the United States recognized the Shanghai Roots and Shoots organic garden program Zizi has also received the 2016 Future Leaders Award from the Shanghai American Chamber of Commerce and was selected to participate in the environmental education program for future leaders of southeast asia opened by the hosted by the japan foundation as well as many other um 
honors for the great work that she has done in this space. So we're very excited to have um, Zizi joining us here today. Our second speaker is Mai Yamaguchi, who is a professor in the Department of Integrated Human Studies and the Graduate School of Social Work at Japan Lutheran College in Tokyo. She is also a certified social worker and director of Carers Japan. She is a committee member of the Policy and Strategy Working Group of the International Alliance of Carer Organizations, and she received her master's degree in gerontology from the University of Southern California in the United States and her doctor degree in social work from Sophia University in Japan. Her research interests include supporting carers, the care mix for elderly long-term services, socialization of care and social work in health and care organizations. She also received a grant in aid for scientific research from the Japanese Society of the Promotion of Science twice as a lead researcher and several times as a co-researcher. She has also received the fund for Japan Luthania Joint Seminar from the same organization. So very excited to have my colleague Mai as our second panelist. And our third pan panelist is Yongju Ri, an associate professor for the Department of Health Sciences at Dongduk Women's University, which is in Seoul, Korea. Before joining the university in 2011, she worked as research faculty at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, which is located in Chicago in the United States. Her research interest areas are caregiving, end of life care, outcome evaluation, and mental health issues, including dementia and depression. Her main research interest is in exploring the health policy and system issues for older adults to promote home death and to find a better way to improve quality of life by integrating medical services and community care. She has published a paper to integrate medical and social services for older Koreans who are managing frailty and to develop community care funded by the In Korean Institute for Health and Social Affairs. She's currently working on a project for caregiving demand um, that looks at the projections and economic values for older Koreans until 2065 and is collaborating with the Care Policy and Policy Evaluation Center of the London School of Economics and Political Science. So we have just a wonderful panel and we're going to kick things off um, with Zizi from Shanghai Roots and Shoots. Thank you, thank you very much, Grace. Uh, and a good day to everyone in the audience. Uh, so I will see if, um, can I take a look at the slides? Um, so I, 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 I do not begin to um, describe the uh, general issue of caregiving in, in China. Uh, I hope that um, today's presentation, I will be able to give you some broad stroke ideas of uh, the challenges we have right now. Um, and also um, with that, uh, I'll highlight um, caregiving in, uh, during the pandemic uh, as we are all dealing with um, around the globe. Uh, so, well, sorry, I, can I, I'm, I'm sorry, is this a technical problem? I don't see the slides. Do I? So, um, Zizi, it may be if huh? you're on a mobile device, you may not be oh, able okay, to I got it, it without swiping. Okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, that, that, that was just me. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, uh, China as uh, many other countries, um, Dr. Ganga was also talking about India. So I guess it's very similar uh, in all Asian countries that um, you know, caregiving amongst family members, that's considered a responsibility. It's just what you do. Uh, people don't ask questions. Um, and then at the same time, the flip side is that carers, they're basically neglected. Essentially, everybody is a carer, but um, nobody really speaks about it. And then um, at the same time, 
all carers, they deal with the same issues. They, um, they're burnout. Um, they, they don't feel that they have all the resources they need from the community or from the family uh, to, to continue to carry out their responsibilities. At the same time, they have to um, also earn a living um, and uh, care for other members um, of the family as well. So that's, um, it's actually quite common. So I believe that, um, you know, many people in the, in the audience, they, they feel the same way. This is exactly what they're doing right now. Um, I think that um, for China though, uh, we heard our speakers um, talk about aging issues in China. Uh, it's, um, well, I'm sorry, in their respective countries, it's um, certainly most true in, it's certainly most true in China as well, because we have, um, a, a number of uh, challenges that are unique. Um, for example, uh, the single child policy. Uh, I myself is a single child generation um, person. So um, I have to care for my parents. And if I were married, I will have to care for my in-laws as well. And I will have to uh, care for my children. So it's two um, people, a couple in their prime age, a prime working age, they have to earn a living to support all their family members. At the same time, they have to figure out um, just two person, how are they supposed to uh, take care of, um, you know, four elderly and then maybe two or more children. So that's a lot of um, financial stress to say the least and uh, a lot of physical stress um, as well. So that's quite unique. The government is trying to uh, encourage people to have more children. They see that down the road, they have to um, reconfigure the um, age structure of, of our population, but um, it's gonna take quite a long time. So um, for sure that, um, that, that, that this sandwich carers situation will continue on for quite a while. And then um, also we have, um, of course, Carers, unpaid carers can be supported and uh, can be uh, helped by professional carers. But um, right now, um, as we speak, this profession itself, it's, um, there's a lot of prejudice. Um, and then people feel that uh, it's uh, menial work, it's below, um, you know, certainly college degree. Uh, and then the mindset, mindset shift, uh, shift is about to happen as well, it has to happen. Otherwise um, our, our unpaid carers will be left alone pretty much um, fending for themselves. So uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so um, we were talking about um, all these gaps. So I don't have to you know, read from the slide. Um, so, we are looking at all these numbers and it's um, very obvious that um, carers in China, um, the young carers or relatively young carers, they do not necessarily have the uh, knowledge, the technique um, required to, to carry out their responsibilities, their, their duties. Um, take, for example, you know, as a single child generation person myself, I do not really know how to care for my parents necessarily, um, because you know we when we grow when we grew up, um, we were very much focused on our schoolwork, and uh, we our parents took care of us for sure. And uh, these days, you know, parents if they are able, they're taking care of their grandchildren. So this sandwich generation, um, they do not have the training necessarily. And then also they do not know where to find resources. And the truth be told, there are not that many resources uh, widely available. Um, so that's um, an issue that um, you know, we've been struggling with for quite a while now. And the government has realized that this has to change. So um, right now we have some um, new policies, new, initiative, new initiatives coming out. Um, and uh, that's actually independent of the pandemic itself. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So, um, so in general, uh, our government sees that uh, we have to make sure that um, most caregiving 
uh, is provided by un unpaid carers. So our idea is that 90% of the people in our community for elder care, they should be staying home. So, you know, the, the large portion of the burden falls on unpaid carers. And then 7%, maybe they stay at, uh, you know, daycare centers uh, for when their children are at work, but then, you know, in the evening they can be picked up um, and go home. And then only 3% are supposed to stay at, you know, all day caregiving facilities. So you can see the structure um, and uh, we are not yet completely prepared um, for that shift yet. And uh, of course, we talk about telemedicine, we talk about all the technology that we can utilize to help support carers. So that's, um, again, um, it's unclear yet uh, how that's being implemented. We see pilot programs here and there. Uh, I live in Shanghai, so it's a relatively well-developed city. Um, and then there are, we see that, you know, there are a lot of efforts being made, um, but um, it hasn't been, you know, sort of systemized or, or replicated um, on a larger scale. So uh, we're waiting to see if the government has um, a longer term plan or um, the, the, you know, the, the grand scale plan to make things work around the country. But at the same time, we have this disparity um, between regions uh, in China. So um, that's also a barrier that's uh, pretty, you know, pretty daunting for, for, for many to say the least. Uh, so, you know, because we're talking about COVID-19, uh, this pandemic, uh, I just want to quickly give you some ideas what happened in China. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, carers in China, they pretty much face the same challenges as you are confronted with right now. So I guess uh, most critically um, carers in China, they, they had very limited access to hospital care um, because hospitals, many of them were shut down or they only gave um, priorities to COVID related uh, cases. So a lot of patients who needed uh, surgeries or who needed prescription uh, medicine, they were not able to um, get those um, immediately. So carers, of course, they had to uh, shoulder a lot of the stress um, and a lot of the responsibilities. And then also uh, the same as in many other countries, uh, it was for a while, it was pretty difficult to secure uh, PPE um, for, for carers themselves and uh, for their family members. And uh, also for those who have, who have their parents in nursing homes, for a long while, nursing homes, um, you know, they were pretty much locked down. So for, for children to be able to visit their parents, they will have to wait for months. So that, there was a lot of anxiety over there as well. But um, right now, uh, because COVID is pretty much under control in China, uh, everything has, gone back to normal, um, other than the fact that people are not really able to travel much, uh, which is okay. For us though, the, for the long-term effect, it's mostly the economic recession. So for carers, I think the economic burden is um, huge. And uh, um, we also oftentimes neglect the fact of, you know, um, psychological stress. We do not really talk about it. It's pretty much a taboo in China as well. So uh, there, needs to be um, some, some services, some, some help in that regard to help support the carers. And also I want to say that though, uh, with that, we, we also have the um, opportunities because um, since this is a problem and uh, we can have, um, you know, the government feels that um, there's this, this pressure to have policies out, uh, to have subsidies out for, for um, elder care, um, and then also we see that um, the industry may see this as a um, niche to, to develop more technology to uh, popularize um, you know, telemedicine um, and uh, that could also create more job opportunities as well. So uh, I see that uh, my time is pretty much up. I will stop here for a bit and I welcome all the questions from the audience and uh, I will also pass this uh, mic on to Dr. Yamaguchi. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. 
Thank you, Zizi. And I'm honored to be here. I am Maya Maguchi of the Care of Japan. I talk about family caregiving in Japan. Next slide, please. Uh, Japanese society has been facing the rapid aging population and decline. In 2019, about 28% of the population is aged over 65 with 15% of age over 75. There are about 6 million of caregivers in Japan. It is around 5% of the total population, but this would be underestimated due to the survey design. One in three of are male caregivers and one in two are working caregivers. Women account for 80% of those who have quit their job due to caring roles. Many older caregivers care for their old family members who need care. More than half of main caregivers of the frail elderly are those with same household. It is surprising that three in five caregivers and care cared for living together are both age over 65 and one in three of those are both age over 75. This is an avoidable reality of community care in Japanese aging society. Young care is a new agenda for Japan and society has just started recognizing young care. According to the survey in Saitama Prefecture, one in 25 of the high school students are young care of their parents, grandparents, and siblings. Issues of young care is important for Japan because it connects the problem of not only for the care for the elderly, but also care for the mental and physical needs. Care-related murder by family caregivers is a crucial societal concern. There are about 40 cases of the care-related homicide or murder-suicide per year. Unfortunately, in Japan, there is no registration specific to caregivers. The agenda for supporting caregivers appears to have been marginalized. The National Long-Term Care Insurance System has established in 2000, 2000 to fund formal care services for eligible older adults. Although the number of the service users has increased in 20 years, family caregivers still have a crucial role. Within the long-term care insurance system, programs for caregivers are not mandated. Japanese government are taking efforts to support working caregivers and to achieve no one forced to leave their job for nursing care. In 2016, the Child and Family Care Leave Act was amended to improve flexibility of the program. The family care benefit rate during the leave for working caregivers was increased to 67% of the wage, but the users of the family care leave are not so many. In 2018, Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare produced Family Care Support Manual for the municipalities and community general support centers. Although it is just a manual, it might be an important step. In 2020, there are some good news. In March, Saitama Prefecture enacted the first ordinance to support carers. In December this, this month, and the first nationwide young care survey will be carried out. Next slide, please. About COVID-19, Japan seems to be relatively well supporting, responding to COVID-19. Japanese government chose soft lockdown approach and declaration of the state of the emergency was only during April and May, but since the last month, we are facing the third wave. Medical and so social care system is damaged, especially due to the group infection of the coronavirus at the hospital and welfare facilities for the elderly and people with disabilities. Family caregivers are having harsh time 
because of the limit of the use of the care services, the restriction of visiting to care facility and lacking alternative services for coronavirus shutdown. Many care providers became bankrupt or need to close services. As mentioned, even before COVID-19, many family caregivers have taken significant role to care for the frail loved ones. At the same time, essential formal care services such as daycare center were fully provided. By COVID-19 pandemic, more burden is put to many family caregivers without having sufficient formal care services. To find out the situation of the family caregivers, Carers Japan conducted COVID-19 care survey in March. We found that one half of the respondents said they don't know what to do and they have no one done to. We also found that the family caregivers, especially caregivers of the, those for medical care needs, suffered due to the shortage of the necessary care equipment. We had lots of helpless voices of the caregivers. Furthermore, during the pandemic, we had many sad stories such as some caregiver murdered his mother. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes. As mentioned in Japan, there is no mandated service specific to caregivers. But considering the difficult situation of the family caregivers during the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to consider the issues of supporting carers as a major issue. In some progressive communities, carer support organizations run the carers cafe, and there are some supports for working caregivers double carers of the sandwich generation and older caregivers. But to support caregivers more widely and to prevent murders by caregivers, we need action for financial security for carers, action towards the establishment of the Carer Support Promotion Act and action to expand carer support ordinance to other prefectures and municipalities. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Carers Japan has developed Kara Emergency Suite to help carers pass their roles to others in case of the emergencies. We requested the national government to address the issue related to COVID-19 and carer support. In response, the, gov the government has added information on this Care emergency sheet to the COVID-19 question and answer page on their website. Since such a tool is essential in no emergency situations as well, we continue to refine the sheet so that it can be used more wisely. We are having a difficult time due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we need to take further actions to support family caregivers in Japan. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Yamaguchi. That was, that was very, very um, informative. Um, and uh, next, can we have uh, Dr. Ree? Yes, I'm ready. To give the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Yong Juri from Seoul, Korea. I'd like to talk a little bit about the family caregiving and then uh, COVID-19 situation in Korea. Next slide, please. Well, probably you already know that the uh, South Korea is the really fast aging society in the world. Actually, you are really getting close to Japanese actual situation. So when I can actually show the uh, some uh, demographic uh, change, uh, probably in 10 years, 25% uh, of our population is going to be uh, age over 65. And then 2067, 46% of the Korean population is going to be actually senior. So it's really growing fast. And then uh, that actually implied we need to uh, uh, have a, a growing 
caregiving demand too. The other interesting thing is our family dynamics exchange for the past decade. So for example, our senior man's actual divorce rate has gone up. So in, in 2018, uh, stats uh, about 16% of the uh, uh, older Koreans who are older than 65, they have an uh, increased divorce rate. Also, the seniors living alone rate has been gone up a lot. So for example, the women, in women who are uh, age over 65, uh, about 25% that they're actually uh, living arrangement for the actual living alone community is actually gone up. The other, okay, uh, the other uh, thing is um, like other, another Asian country, uh, family members, family caregivers actually still play the major role to provide care. The, the spouse is the actually a primary caregivers after all. So 41% of the uh, caregivers are a spouse and then their grown up children, son or daughters are the another next major, particularly daughter, they actually the another uh, second source of the caregiving. And then their grown up actually in law children is the actually last. Uh, in the old times, mother, uh, daughter in law, uh, they're the actually major caregivers for the older Koreans, but nowadays it's not true. But the funny thing is, current young older Koreans, they don't have a higher actual expectation from their grown up children when they grow older. Uh, in other words, they actually wanted to have a more uh, systematic actually support from the government or system too. So in 2008, Korean actually, uh, they also, we, we also established the long-term care insurance system like in Japan. So we actually put aside for the certain uh, insurance money for the caregiving uh, through the system. So up to now, uh, about the 8.8% of the Korean seniors, they could actually receive any type of a care through the, this long-term care insurance system, uh, whether they receive the care in nursing home facility or home care a visit in their own home. So only 32% of the uh, applicants, they can get the uh, long-term care benefits in the actual long-term care benefit uh, uh, facility. Uh, compared to the other OECD countries, still we do have very low um, benefits from the system. Uh, in other words, we have a much greater actually uh, uh, need for the uh, caregiving in uh, society too. Also, we have a still higher unmet need for the care. Only 80% of the applicants for the long-term care benefits are eligible to receive any type of care. So about the 20% uh, of the applicants, they couldn't get any type of a care. So they have to uh, rely on their family care uh, givers actually a source. The, the other interesting thing is uh, uh, young, older Koreans, like uh, older than 60s, early 60s, they do have a very stronger uh, preference to receive the care when they are growing older, but at, this time, we still have a strong stigma to relocate their older Koreans to the nursing home. So it's a really inconsistent mixed culture of barriers to use former care through the actual long-term care facility. Next slide, please. So, uh, Except that it's a long-term care actual system, we do have a, some kind of uh, uh, support for the caregivers. There is a direct service for the carers and then there's a, some indirect supportive system for carers in community. For example, uh, we do have uh, actually a separate counseling service paid through the national health insurance since 2018. We had uh, actually sporadic counseling or education program through the uh, Dementia Community Center, but it's uh, only so independent another uh, service uh, uh, earmarked for the actual carers actually uh, mental health. 
Also, we do have a very nationwide comprehensive dementia community care center, which actually uh, aims for the early assessment and then provide some education. And then they also provide daycare and then they also can be a, a support group too. So since 2018, we actually uh, increased the budget for the older dementia care in community is almost 10 times greater than before. So it's a nationwide really good uh, source to access any type of care for the uh, caregivers. And then there's also a comprehensive care system for the older Koreans with a low income, uh, particularly uh, those who are living alone in community, so they can get the meal service from the any support from the, their uh, activity daily living or other leisure uh, services. It's all uh, embedded in the one package and that is a really good service too. Uh, the other indirect support system for the carers in community, there is a very unique uh, allowance benefits for the carers in community uh, paid through the long-term care insurance. So there's an allowance uh, uh, benefits for them, uh, but you have to go through some kind of professional workshop education program, and then you need to get the certified family uh, carers and approved by long-term care insurance. It is about $150 uh, per month is a flat rate. Uh, it's, it's only one actually cash benefit through the system for the care, family caregivers. And then there's also flexible work system, but it's really hard to use as uh, full-time workers. So it's uh, still uh, uh, not quite uh, good uh, uh, support for them. And then family sick leave actually is available up to 90 days per year. So if you have a really strong, uh, uh, compelling reason to take care of your family members, you can actually use the sick leave uh, at work. And then respite care is available up to six days per year is mainly for the uh, caregivers for the uh, dementia patients in community too. Next slide, please. I'd like to go over a little bit about our COVID-19 situation. Like in Japan, we have been doing so far well until end of October, when you see that this uh, stats, we have very low case and low brutality. So if you, uh, uh, only really old, older Koreans over uh, age 80s, they have a very high mortality, like 28%, but, uh, our actually actual numbers, uh, COVID cases, pretty low, so it was really pretty man manageable. And then uh, all the cases uh, for the older population in Korea uh, is uh, less than a three percent. Uh, it was pretty good success to actually maintain very low until the uh, end of October, but since last week, uh, it was quite a bit. Uh, uh, extremely uh, increasing. So we are really uh, concerned about the, uh, how to protect these older people. And then right after COVID-19 outbreak, we developed a protocol for the nursing home and home care visit, uh, home care employees. And then we uh, thoroughly uh, just follow this protocol and then uh, let them also get all the tests in long-term care facility. Uh, so, there's also a cash uh, financial actually uh, support for that. So they can get the discount for the uh, death test fee in the nursing home. Also, there is a, a 54 billion free mask given away to the older populace in, in community, particularly uh, older Koreans who are living alone or doesn't have any family members. So all the local government actually uh, literally visit their homes to give away masks to protect them too. Also, fl uh, free flu shot uh, vaccination is uh, available for the older Koreans. And then it's been years, but this year has been much more widely spread. And then you can get the uh, uh, free flu shot in the local community center or in any clinic if you show the actually uh, your ID. But still, we need to have a much more uh, direct support for the carers at home. So first, first off, they sh uh, uh, actually reported 
greater demand to have a more home care visit and the particular direct service for spouse care. Also, we need to develop the more direct service services people who are living alone in communities. So that's pretty much a concerning part. And then uh, in nursing home part, uh, because we have a very strong stigma to send our or older parents or family members to nursing home. So we try to develop the more like a home, like unit in nursing home, so they can get much familiar with their surroundings and have a better quality of service in, in long-term care facilities too. So it's all uh, underway uh, a process. And then we are really still working on that too. So since the two other previous panelists to talk about the uh, some of the mental health issue for the COVID-19 uh, in Korea, we actually have a free counseling services through a local community center. There's a hotline for the older people who express the COVID-19 blue. So you can get the uh, free counseling and then you can refer to the hospital if you feel really symptoms are really severe. Also, uh, we are trying to develop a, a serious community care uh, for the past three years because after we anticipated a long-term care demand in nursing home, we cannot get, we cannot get afford to do, provide all the care through the, this uh, uh, long-term care facility. So we switched the whole direction to keep the older uh, uh, family, older Korean members in community and they support the family members. That's why we are trying to explore more diverse uh, support program for the family members in community. So community care actually will at least it were in Korea, try to develop uh, nowadays, but it's still underway. So uh, probably uh, next year, or we, we can get the much more clear picture how to run this whole uh, system too. I think this, is this is pretty much my uh, talk. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ri. Well, um, in the interest of time, uh, I don't know, Grace, do you have many questions that um, you would like to just kick off now or? Yeah, I um, actually, um, can you hear me okay? Oh yeah. Okay, great. I so um, one of the things that I was thinking about as I as I was listening to these wonderful presentations is about how in in many of your countries you've been able to contain the COVID nineteen vaccine. Um, it seems like the cultural um, assumption that uh, that sort of families have for caregiving and sort of this community attitude of, you know, we all have a responsibility to public health in some ways has sort of both helped people with the pandemic to control the spread of it, but also put more pressure on carers who are in the home. Um, so I, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts of that thinking about how, like for example, in the United States, we're having debates about whether we should even wear a mask or not. Um, so, but we know that the, the caregivers who are at home are facing those additional pressures because they feel like not only can they not ask for help, but now they're isolated in their homes. Well, uh, I'll just quickly say that, uh, you know, in China, it's interesting because we, 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 we were not used to wearing masks to begin with, but um, since, you know, there had, there had been so much traveling, um, you know, people going to Japan, going to Korea, we actually picked up that um, habit, even, even way before this pandemic, uh, we started wearing masks. We realized that, um, you know, in Japan, in Korea, you wear masks when you are sick because you don't want to pass the germ onto other people. It's just out of respect uh, for, for other people in the community. So uh, once, the pandemic hit, it wasn't really difficult for us to switch to it immediately. Uh, and now it goes without saying that um, if we go on any public transport, uh, we have to wear a mask. It's actually a, a law now. So you don't mess with that at all. So just, to, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, what's been going on here in China. 
Interesting. Um, Yongju, uh, do you have well, any thoughts? Well, we we didn't have any kind of um uh, uh, any negative feeling to wear the mask because because for the past few years we have been struggled with the yellow fever or micro dust, all the air pollution issues. So we, funny thing is when you listen to the broadcasting, uh, the weather, you actually listen to the, uh, look at, you can be informed to with the yellow uh, dust and the micro dust actual level. And then they encourage it to wear the mask next next morning or so. So it wasn't the issue, but the, you know, the issue was the uh, mask shortage in short time. So the government has to come up with some idea to how we can actually get the, everybody get the uh, mask. So we use the uh, our uh, national insurance ID system to ident identify uh, if you can get the uh, by the mask uh, two or three uh, using your mask, that was a max and you can get more than that. So you, 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 we used actually personal ID information to buy the public mask for a while, but not, it's, it, it's open now, but because it, about the three or four months, we have been really struggled with the uh, uh, mask assurance. So that was uh, uh, it. Uh, but thing is that uh, all the couple who cannot actually get the, uh, a uh, mask of their own. Uh, local government actually tried to reach out to send them out by mail or in person. That that was really noble and very decent too, because some of them cannot go to the pharmacy or go to store, and that they are really afraid to go out to actually uh, houses. Some of us older couples kind of confess that they haven't gone out uh, their houses for days because they're so afraid they don't have a mask. So that was on the news. So people are noticed that they have to give away some of the masks to the uh, vulnerable or the population too, yeah. Hmm. Mai, do you have thoughts you would like to add? Uh, yes, about the mask for the uh, Japanese government sent the mask to everybody, but not so many people using it, that mask, but it's like, a, not a mandate, but it's like, a, social rules to have a mask anytime. So it's okay for everybody, but for somebody, for the people with dementia, they don't understand, so they have to keep keep the mask on, but and the people with the disability or children with disability, sometimes they don't want to. So it's very hard to and hard for the for the carers and and those. So society, some people said, oh you have to you have to wear any time, even running even anytime they have to wear a mask. That is sometimes it's stressful and sad. And that's a problem. And it so, so social society people is concerned too much. For example, so pe they who live in Tokyo, they don't want to, and, and caring for the distance for the other prefecture. They they said particularly the rural area, they don't want don't, they don't come because you are coming to Tokyo because they, it's not it's very dangerous or something like that. It was not a stigma, but it's a sad story that stress all family members. Yeah. But in Korea, five years ago, we had a really terrible memory about the MERS outbreak in Seoul. So yeah. we, we, are, we are literally traumatized of that. Even, even I was really shocked at the time. So people are extremely con conscious about how, you, how to protect yourself and others uh, in wearing masks. It's a simple matter. So right after COVID-19 outbreak in March and April, every public transportation and then all the streets, you can get the uh, any type of uh, uh, sign or poster to wear how to wear wear the mask and then wash your hands and everywhere. It, it, it was so quickly actually. So I was uh, really impressed by that. So. That's very, that's very interesting how that previous experience really gave you an opportunity to sort of prepare as a society for what happens next. Um, I, I would, so I would say um, one of the questions that we're wrestling with in the United States is vaccines and who gets access to the vaccines first. We've had everyone from healthcare workers to even um, 
at the at the shopping malls this time of year we have people who you know pretend to be santa claus and children uh-huh. come and so there's a there's even a lobbying group for all the santa claus workers <laughs> and they've said we should get the vaccine first so I, I, but one of the questions we've had um particularly in communities related to alzheimer's and dementia is should family carers be one of the groups that get access, early access to the vaccine? And so I I would love to hear sort of your perspectives on that and whether that's something that has been the subject of debate in your nation. Well, uh, I'll I'll be very brief uh, because actually vaccine itself, uh, it's being discussed and we see it in the news, but um, since we have so few cases here now in China, it's uh, not, um, you know, people's preference. Just uh, for for I, I guess we had a f- uh, maybe twenty thousand people who had the vaccine, but those were to be dispatched to foreign countries on foreign missions mostly, or they had to uh, work um, in in other countries. For those who live in China, I think right now people rely more on prevention, uh, wearing masks in terms of you know everyday practice rather than vaccine. So if the vaccine comes out and it proves to be safe and reliable and effective for a reasonable period, people may consider taking it. Um, Otherwise, I think at this point of time, um, it's not really uh, what people are most concerned about. Um, Yongju? Oh, well, in Korea, probably we we are we are we all agree that the uh, you know, health professionals so they should get the vaccine first, and the next vulnerable population like a uh, uh, nursing or resident and the older population who are older than actually seventy certain age and their family members because now the in the third wave we identified all the uh, uh, big surge in some of the nursing home and then of all the family members who are living together. So it's all spread all different places. So now we are really concerned how we can kind of stop this, you know, uh, epidemics. So I don't think it's gonna be a big issue to how to prioritize who get the vaccine first, but we need to get the vaccine first. I think our government still working on uh, uh, deal with uh, actually some of our uh, pharmaceutical company Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca. So because uh, we already had a uh, pre-deal with AstraZeneca, but they couldn't get the FDA approval. So that's why we are facing that issue. So other than that, probably people are so okay with that to give away to the the most vulnerable people first. My. Yes, about the vaccine. I first read the article from the Carers Australia that they are taking the initiative to 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 the care of informal caregivers for the vaccine first group for the vaccine first group. So before that, I didn't think about that because in Japan, uh, elders or vulnerable and essential workers of the healthcare professionals should be first, but never talking about the issue of the informal care. So I, we are learning from worldwide and I send a me- message to other directors that we need to do something to do that. And there are incentives for the uh, health professionals. They are, we are very thank you, but society never think about the inform- informal caregivers. So. It's including a vaccine. We need to recognize the inform- law, the essential law of the informal caregivers. So this next question, I I want to start with you, my, and it's about mental health and and counseling services. So um, one of our listeners has asked about how supports work for mental health and carers in your country. And then one of our colleagues on Facebook has said, it is fantastic that carers have free community counseling services in South Korea, um, but, but is curious about the stigma that exists with using nursing homes based on this idea of caregiving being a family duty. And, and how does that prevent people from getting mental health support? So I'm, I'm thinking yeah. my, um, let's start with my, and then we'll go to you, Yongju, and then um, Zizi. 
Okay, so mental health issue is very important for Japan, but uh, issue of the mental is related to the specific to the uh, informal care is not exist. So it's very important issue lying for the caregivers for the people with mental mental health and other second issue is a mental health for the family caregivers so some there is a not specific department or something and no program but maybe we need this is the time to make integrated support we i said there is no counseling for there is some but it's not integrated so we need integrated support for informal caregivers for any type of the carers thank you well uh first up to korea uh we we have been uh, really struggle with the mental health issue um for the past 10 years we we've known for the uh first rank in suicide rate in OECD countries so uh, th that's not as a tackle issue to uh, to uh, prevent that one. So first off, the uh, counseling service part, uh, we have been doing it informally uh, now and then, but uh, now it's in, uh, in our uh, payment system. So you can get the free counseling and then you can get the, some uh, support group uh, through the uh, nationwide dementia community center, particularly uh, caregivers who are living with a dementia patient, that they are really, really uh, stressed out uh, dealing with a lot of mental health issue. Also, there's some mishap to actually kill the actually family members that kill themselves. And sometimes it happens a lot. So we are trying to prevent that one too. But in also along, along with the mental health issue, we have a very strong stigma still uh, about the dementia. So uh, government in the uh, uh, dementia, the older organization try to raise the awareness about the dementia, how to uh, recognize the, the dementia as uh, just a, a illness and the how to deal with that or how to live with the dementia patient in community and in their own homes and how to reach out to get help through the system. So it's a huge actually new protocol to develop to uh, uh, educate all the Korean actually family caregivers. So because the government, this administration have a strong keen interest to, to uh, deal with the dementia care since in 2017. So we, we have almost uh, 10 times, you know, increased the budget for that. So it's actually undergoing. The other part is uh, we try to identify the uh, early dementia um, uh, older Koreans in community. So through the, the dementia care center, we actually uh, reach out to people who are older than sixty, and then you have to you have to come in and they get the actually MMSC test, and that it's gonna be in data in the system. So it's a brand new too uh, last, since last year. So we can do much more uh, data driven actual policy you know program too. So actually. Uh, I'm pretty impressed by the, all the change that has been undergoing in short time. So because of, we are just uh, facing such a serious problem with this mm -hmm. older population and caregiving, the, but, on, on, uh, but it's a really misfortune to identify the caregiving issue itself. That's why I'm trying to address this issue throughout the research and uh, just some of a meeting with the policymakers and all that too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, um, I am thrilled uh, to hear uh, Dr. Reed talk about all these uh, advancements in made in Korea, because I'm pretty sure that uh, when it comes to elder care, we, you know, we look at Japan, we look at South Korea, because, you know, we are quite similar in culture. Um, a, a lot of the best practices uh, in Western countries we adopt, but um, sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's, it's those practices in South Korea and Japan that are actually more um, adaptable uh, for us or more applicable in, in our in our cases. Uh, in terms of you know mental health in general in China, I don't think you know uh, you know uh, much has well or enough has been uh, done yet. I guess you know culturally speaking, again you know a lot of taboo associated with any mental problems. So um, if um, 
if 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 a carer is stressed out, we feel that you know it's you know okay, it takes some time, it relax, take a deep breath. Uh, it, nobody really thinks it's a big deal, and because of that, uh, carers don't even want to talk about it because they feel that uh, oh, why am I supposed to complain about it? Why am I whining? I'm you know, just being very weak. Uh, so theoretically, um, all hospitals and many community centers, they have um, free counselors, uh, but I don't think people really utilize those services. Um, and uh, in terms of serious professional counseling, I don't think they are provided free of charge. Um, so, and, and not that people will actually actively seek those services to begin with. Um, so there's certainly this, um, you know, need to, to raise the awareness. Uh, I, it's gonna take some time, but um, I feel that if we look at, um, you know, Dr. Ree was talking about all these um, exciting developments. I think that uh, we will definitely draw on those experiences um, coupled with all the technology uh, advancement. So I, I you know, the other, um, good policies that's being implemented, uh, that, that are being implemented in South Korea, uh, I think like meal centers, uh, you know, um, or the uh, home care services uh, provided by the community subsidized by the government. Uh, I see those happening right now, mostly in cities, in, in big, bigger urban development city, uh, develop the cities, but um, uh, hopefully we will be able to um, reach the rural areas as well. But, uh, um, you know, I, right now, uh, I, I do feel that um, we that much can be done in, in the area of, of counseling for for carers. Um, and uh, I hope that um, later on, we will be able to, again, learn from our um, you know, neighboring countries to to see how we can best get there. Yeah, so Korea is really interesting to how quickly done everything so uh, recently <laughs> we developed the uh, depression measure app and it's going to be available for everybody who wanted to actually uh, diagnose their depression rates mm -hmm. and then if you didn't want to get referred to the psychiatrist or psychologist so it's going to be nationwide uh, from the next year I mean it's really uh, 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 surprisingly <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was also really shocked. Wow, it's really going so fast because uh, uh, it's everywhere. So um, it's not only caregivers. So I think so that's going to be interesting too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I gosh, I could talk with you all day. <laughs> it's so fascinating, both the things that we share across um, nations and, you know, the wonderful research and and topics that you're working on that can help inform other nations about how to tackle care, health, and well-being in their in their own country. So, I just want to extend a, a thank you for joining us today. And of course, you are welcome to um, stay and continue to part you know participate and listen in. Um, but thank you so much. We're we're very very appreciative of your time and your presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. So for those of you who are listening in online, I want to um, introduce to you um, a, a family caregiver who comes to us um, through the Carriage Japan Network. And um, we're very honored to have her perspectives. We have um, for each of the days of our World Carers Conversation, asked a family caregiver to provide their unique perspectives and their lived experiences um, under the philosophy that healthcare and social care policies should be driven by the real experiences of the people who are living them day to day. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, our speaker for today. Um, Kyoko Kishimoto is a caregiver for her mother in Tokyo, Japan. She's also a ballet instructor and she sometimes visits and gets support from the Aladdin Carer Support Network Center in Tokyo, which is one of the leading nonprofit carer support organizations in Japan. She has some experiences of talking about her caring journey at the Conference of Human Service Professionals in Japan. But this is her first speech to talk about her experience at a global summit in English and the representative 
of the Aladdin Carer Support Network Center recommended her to make a speech. So we are very thankful um, for her willingness to come and to speak to us and to share her perspective. So I would invite um, her to, to please feel free to go ahead and take yourself off of mute and, um, and to turn on your camera. Hello, thank you for having me. Today, I'm going to talk about my experience as caregiver. I have been care caring for my mother at home for 18 years. She had stroke in 2002 when she was age 56 and she's now age 74. She needs care all the time since one half of her body is paralyzed and she got a loss of speech caused by stroke. So I was, I, so I had to leave my full-time job as office worker due to my caring role in 2000, 2000, uh, 2006 when I was in 30s. I have been, learning ballet since I was a kid. So I, char I changed my career and I have been working as part-time ballet instructor since then. I love my current but job, but due to COVID-19, the amount of job as instructor is decreasing. My mother is satisfied user of public long-term care in insurance program. And she can use several eligible services within the program. She used, she used date care for four times a week, home visiting rehabilitation once a week, and home visiting medical care every other week. Next slide, please. By COVID-19 pandemic, I felt stress as a caregiver because of the shortage of alcohol-based sanitizer, which is a crucial item for my mother. I felt that people did not understand at all that there are those who would suffer like us if they cannot get these items. In April and May, during the period of declaration of a state of emergency, service hours of daycare were shortened. For family caregiver, these two months were the period of I felt my mother care came back so quickly and that I could not do anything. Nonetheless, I thank that the daycare was still open at that time because they provided passing service for my mother. During the end of August and the beginning of September, since cluster occurred at my mother's daycare center. We could not use any care service for two weeks. These two weeks were a nightmare for me and I have never experienced such a long time to such a long two weeks. During that time, I could not have any break could not go shopping to supermarket and could not do anything for myself. Staff of, what, of the daycare of my mother said, the most of users who decide not to use, the, use daycare discreet the, their physical strengths and those with dementia got worse. 
our home doctor also worry about these problems. So I also worry that my mother physical strength and function would, would be getting worse by not going to daycare. Before COVID-19, one of my friends of caregivers whose mother with dementia had got to admission of group home, she told me that due to COVID-19, her mother had to wait for more than six months. And recently, she was told from the care provider which runs the, this group home that they decide to close up business. She's so upset because she has to give up her mother's admission of group home compared to other caregivers like her. Our family might be better since my mother can be can you stay care even now? But at the same time, I'm also worried that my mother would contract COVID-19 by using daycare because many other users with dementia do not wear face masks. I am nervous and always having a feeling of fear because of another shutdown of daycare would occur again. Suddenly, without any notice in advance, in case there will be users with COVID-19. In closing, I would like to mention that I live in Tokyo and my experience is only for those of urban area. I heard that other caregivers who live in rural area are driven in a corner due to lack of service and discrimination in closed community. For example, one of my acquaintances says that her grandmother who lives in other prefecture could not use her daycare service for a week only because she visiting grandma and mom from Tokyo, one of the most serious area of COVID-19. So Japanese caregivers of other area would have more difficult time. But I hope my story would be helpful to understand the situation of caregivers in Japan. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much um, for this really important perspective and, and particularly for giving this presentation. Um, we really appreciate all of your insights and your, um, and your experiences and what you're going through. So thank you for being willing to share that with all of us. It's much appreciated. So we are going to take a quick five minute break um, which will just allow everyone a chance to get up, to stretch, to refresh your coffee. And we will return at about five minutes to the top of the hour for our, for our session on caregiving um, in Asia and the South Pacific, focused specifically on Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Australia, and New Zealand. So hang tight, take a five minute break and get another cup of coffee or tea. And we will be back in just a moment. Hi, and um, welcome back to the World Carers Conversation, our virtual summit on the state of caregiving in the era of COVID-19. And I am Grace Whiting, the president and CEO at the National Alliance for Caregiving in Washington, DC and the United States. I am so happy to introduce our next panel to you and to share with you um, a, a wonderful slate of experts who will be talking 
about caregiving and the impact of COVID-19 in their home nations. So if our panelists would go ahead and take um, your video, um, go ahead and turn on your video. Um, and then Charlotte, if you could put up the slide um, to, of our speaker panels. And as folks are pulling that up, just a reminder that you're welcome to submit your questions, comments, and insights um, in the chat box here uh, and in the Q&A box. We also have a number of folks who are sharing um, comments and thoughts online on our Facebook page. So we invite you to continue to comment and engage online. And you can also participate in discussion on Twitter using the hashtag World Carers. So I'm very excited to share with you today, today's panelists. And I wanna start by um, telling you a little bit about our moderator, Dr. Vivian Liu, who is an associate professor at the Department of Social Work and Social Administration at the University of Hong Kong. She is also the director of the Sa Pao Center on Aging, an honorary clinical associate in the Center on Behavioral Health at the University of Hong Kong. She has studied widely issues related to family caregiving, active aging, and their health impacts. And she has looked at the Chinese family caregivers' mental health and the financial impacts um, and really leading pioneer studies that have generated high impact publications. Her recent areas of work include looking at positive and or the resilient capacity of the family caregiver in the Chinese context, including studying secondary caregivers, social supports, roles of caregivers, roles of domestic helpers, and effective intervention strategies. She's also worked on the technological side, pioneering three mobile applications for targeting volunteers, social workers, and stroke families respectively. She teaches social gerontology, clinical gerontology, and human development for both undergraduates and postgraduate students. And she has had publications in journals such as Aging and Mental Health, Family Process, Research, and Research on Social Work Practice, and many others. She's currently a member of the Society of Social Work Research, the Hong Kong Social Workers Association, the Hong Kong Association of Gerontology, and an international affiliate of the American Psychological Association. So very honored to have her here today kicking us off. Our next speaker um, is Dr. Suan Kuo, who serves as the president of the Taiwan Association of Family Caregivers and teaches as an associate professor at the Chongqing Medical University in Taichung City, Taiwan. Established in 1996, the Taiwan Association of Family Caregivers is the only advocacy organization dedicated to caregivers' rights and service development. And in 2016, 20 years after it was founded, they were contracted by the Taiwanese government to lead and advise on the national long-term care services by supervising both local governments and organizations to implement various types of caregiver services, including care management, respite, caregiver education, support groups, psychological counseling, telephone lines, and public education. Professor Kuo is a scholar who's been trained in the United States with social work and gerontological backgrounds. She's also applied her previous experiences to conduct caregiving research and develop dementia and family service models at many caregiver resource centers and dementia integrated care centers in central Taiwan. She received her PhD and master degree in social work at the University of California in Los Angeles and two master's degrees in gerontology and health administration from the University of Southern California. She's worked with a number of practice experiences, including as a program developer for senior organizations, as a medical social worker at a veterans hospital, and as a policy analyst and advocate for health and minority organizations. Her main areas of focus are cross-cultural caregiving issues, reminiscence and life therapy for older adults, 
international comparisons on long-term care policies and programs, advocacy for caregivers, and the dementia program and care management for older adults. And Sue Ann has been actively involved, as has all of our panelists, in the International Alliance of Care Organizations. Our next panelist, Roger Perler, is the chair of Carers New Zealand, which is the national peak body supporting family, Wana and Ega Carers in New Zealand. He has had many years in the public sector and has commercial law experience. He is currently the chief legal counsel for one of New Zealand's major district health boards. Roger has often acted as an advisor to the Carers Alliance, a coalition of almost 50 national health and disability sector NGOs focused on the challenges faced by carers, and he chairs one of New Zealand's philanthropic community trusts. And finally, I'm excited to introduce you to Liz Callahan who is a highly regarded senior executive and the CEO of Carers Australia, which is the peak body organization that works to inform and strengthen national policy and the community and government's understanding of unpaid carer issues. Liz has previously held roles at Catholic Health Australia, the Australian Council on Healthcare Standards, and the Department of Management at RMIT University, Melbourne. Liz has recently spent four years as CEO of Palliative Care Australia, transforming the organization into one that was value-driven, community-focused, and all about improving end-of-life care for all Australians. Prior to joining Carers Australia, Liz worked at the Department of Health on its Aged Care Royal Commission Task Force. So without further ado, I am very honored to hand over the baton to Dr. Vivian Liu to kick off today's discussion. Yeah, hi. <laughs> good morning and uh, good evening. And uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for in inviting me uh, to moderate this session. It is so excited that we can join hands uh, under such a very challenging circumstances worldwide to discuss how we can support uh, carers. Uh, and without further ado, uh, may I invite the first presenter, um, Dr. Ko uh, from Taiwan, please. Thank Hi, you. everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I am going to take off my mask uh, briefly because I'm inside a hospital. So um, I, um, it's a very under very strict rule, but I particularly choose a Christmas mask um, to wanted to start our conversation and wanted to wish everyone a, a, a good holiday um, coming up. So hello everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to make a, a presentation uh, about Taiwan on our efforts in creating a system for all people of all age, ages of different types of caregivers um, in Taiwan. And um, I wonder if I can have the slide. Okay, so um, as, as Grace shared earlier, I am actually a professor at a university and also a director of a dementia center. Um, but um, I'm also involving in the uh, first and only uh, advocacy organization for caregivers, uh, Taiwan Association of Family Caregivers. I've been a board member for a long time and uh, uh, four years ago was elected as uh, president of the organization. Next slide, please. So um, the upper left corner of um, this uh, graph actually show how fast all the aging countries are uh, doing. And as previous session, uh, the speaker from Japan and Korea alluded that uh, we are all aging very fast. <clears throat> Before we were behind uh, the Western countries, but now almost all of us are catching up and um, probably going to exceed uh, many of the Western countries by 2025. As a result, um, you can see the bottom of the slide that um, the Taiwan Association of Family Caregivers was formed in 1996. That's the year when Taiwan was about to turn 
um, to 7% of the overall population uh, that were uh, 65 years and older. So that was the year when we started advocating and noticing the problem of, of caregivers. Um, so we spent about 10 years actually educating or actually spreading the awareness of there's such a role, a social role as a caregiver. Obviously in many Asian countries, um, we uh, have this traditional filial piety belief and then family uh, you know, oriented um, uh, matter for everything. So. So um, you are the daughter of somebody or you are the mother of somebody. So um, it's hard to uh, let all the public notice that you are not only the daughter of somebody, but also your care of this somebody. So we, are, uh, we spent about 10 years educating or spreading the awareness of there's such a social role as a caregiver. And in uh, 2000, we finally was able to bring um, uh, put up a telephone hotline for caregivers. And that was uh, privately um, paid, well, not privately, per, the, the funding was uh, raised by our public uh, fundraising. So to um, fast forward in 2007, uh, we established our national long-term care program. We call it 1.0, it was the first 10 year. And um, that year we were only able to advocate uh, for re respite care um, to put into law in 2007. Um, but we continue our advocacy role. And then uh, in 2016, actually, uh, we were successful in advocating ourselves and the role of caregivers and were put into the 2.0, long-term care 2.0 plan, uh, which the law specify, and there's a chapter dedicating to caregivers, specifying their caregivers have the rights to receive care um, and also have the rights to receive services of eight types, which I will allude to uh, later. So we're in the year of 2000. So within four years of it, the implementation of 10 year long-term care 2.0, the right, right upper corner, uh, the most recent data that we we see that finally we have uh, this population of long-term care families. And right now 53% were covered by government long-term care programs and 30% of the Taiwanese family do hire foreign workers or foreign health workers. Most of them were able to live in home and only uh, reduce uh, self-care to 17% only. And uh, I don't know if this, the figure surprised everybody. Uh, in many of the Asian countries, we continue to say that most of the families do take care of uh, their own family member. In our way, we still do. Um, it's just in addition to taking care of our own family members, we were able to get extra help either using long-term care um, services provided by government. This was sort of like service subsidies, um, or we were able to hire, some families were able to hire foreign workers uh, to uh, be a helper for family caregivers. Next slide, please. So um, our organization started the hotline, which was uh, shown in the uh, next corner, uh, the left upper corner. It was a 800 number, a toll free number for caregivers. Um, all the people who received the phone line were social trained social workers or psycholo psych psychology majors. Um, and the majority of the people who call uh, the top three reasons were first they were they needed to know what kind of services available for their loved ones, or second is that they were a, they they needed somebody to talk to to um, sort of like spill out their emotions and uh, to talk about uh, what how hard it is, and the third is actually increasingly more families are calling to seek for help to how to talk to family members, other family members, so they can take care of their, um, their family loved ones uh, all together. This is also because um, that in many families, uh, even though there are many siblings or many helpers or you know, uh, families network available, um, it all end up uh, being to one family member who is maybe less uh, 
less educated or they earn less money or maybe they were single. So um, there's a imbalance between siblings to, who are taking care of parents or um, share caregiving loads. So in recent years, we actually promoted a, a, a movement that talk to your family members, especially your siblings about taking care of your parents so you can share your family load. And then so because of that campaign, a lot of people are calling in to seek for help and how to talk to their family members to ask for help. Um, it is really hard for family members to ask for help because um, in our traditional culture or social belief that you know you have to take care of your own family. So it's hard for outsiders to come in and help. Um, and then it's even sometimes harder to ask your own family members to ask for help to, to uh, help uh, care for uh, the shared loved one. Okay, so um, because of that, uh, we, as Grace alluded earlier, our organization was put in charge to implement and to, to develop a nationwide service programs. And there are now 106 caregiver resource centers that provide eight types of services. As I alluded earlier, four years ago, uh, all these eight services were put into law uh, in our long-term care 2.0 plan. So, uh, no matter where you live in Taiwan, you're, you're entitled to receive all these eight services, which is shown on the um, right hand side of the bottom of this slide. So um, if a caregiver is really stressed out and then we find out their burden uh, scale is really high, the social worker will actually <clears throat> treat this caregiver as a, as a client and we do intensive case, uh, case management for this caregiver to prevent her from being maybe having depression or suicidal thoughts or um, actually went bankrupt because of uh, caregiving or um, to leave uh, out of work because of caregiving as our previous Japanese uh, speaker said, we really wanted to avoid people uh, leave off work uh, due to caregiving. And the second service is home care skill coaching. So if you have difficulty caring for your loved one, for instance, maybe stroke or something, you can ask for somebody uh, that have been trained to uh, care for stroke and then to come home and teach you how to care for this specific um, disease or illness or condition. Um, and obviously you can also go to community uh, for classes that teach you caregiving skills. So it's, the caregiving skills can be earned both in class or at home. Um, obviously respect services were there 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. And then also um, these 106 caregiver resource centers provide support groups, relaxation groups, and um, caregivers were entitled to six to eight sessions of counseling if they need it. And then every month they will receive a telephone reassurance call from our uh, social workers. Um, and because of this uh, long services uh, or series of services, our organization has actually uh, used our uh, many like six years of data and actually successfully divided or grouped, I guess, uh, caregivers into five different stages, which is shown on the upper corner. Um, so they are carers preparing to enter the caregiving role and they are new caregiver caregivers which are uh, people who maybe just enter the new role uh, between the uh, first month and six months. Usually for a lot of stroke caregivers, the first six months are very chaotic and they don't know how to do it. So they are uh, categorized as new carers. So there are uh, certain types of services and skills taught to the carers. And then uh, the third stage or third categories is uh, working carers. We, as I alluded earlier, we wanted to prevent workers from, oh, these are like employ, employees of any industry from taking off work because of caregiving. So we have some programs assuring them that they can stay at work while balancing their job between care and uh, working and uh, their own life. And the fourth stage is uh, experienced carer. These are carers who maybe have been caregiving for one to three years and then their needs are a little different. Usually they need more emotional support than instrumental support and then maybe need a guidance on uh, surviving their uh, economic hardship or something. And the last one is graduated carers. We usually 
try to channel graduate carers back to become volunteers or caregiver coaches so they can share the experience or continue to um, have some camaraderies um, because uh, some of them have very low social um, network due to caregiving. So staying in touch and being sort of like a mentor to new carers uh, are a very successful uh, role for them to continue their life. Okay, next slide, please. And that will be my last slide. Um, these are things that we are currently doing and advocating. So from the top is the um, services or creative programs that we are doing. Um, we have won the IACO uh, Innovation Award uh, a few years ago because we created these uh, respite coffee workshops and all the coffee, uh, all the people working in the coffee uh, shops they were trained to equipped with basic caregiving skills, uh, knowledge and resources. So in every corner of the caregiver um, coffee uh, cafe, uh, th there's a corner uh, having a lot of information for carers and books that they can go and read and find information. Um, and also we decided to throughout the 106 caregiver resource centers, we do birthday parties for all the caregivers. Um, it was very touching that some of the caregivers said that they haven't had their birthday celebrated for many, many years. And this year, um, a lot of graduate caregivers decided to form a band. And so maybe perhaps next year, Grace, if you're having this session, our band can perform internationally. Um, they are caregiver bands and they are all new people who, who um, just said that, oh, I wish one day I can learn piano. I wish one day I can learn guitar. So these are all fresh uh, caregivers who have never learned this before. And then they form a band and perform nationwide this year. Um, for uh, we are also very dedicated to um, creating models uh, the middle session of the words there. Um, we wanted to develop caregiver life course development sort of like uh, throughout earlier when I said the five stages, we wanted to really spe specify all different five stages and what kind of needs and services and what they can do. Um, um, and then also what they can do to support each other too. Um, I'm sorry, there's a typo there, a multi-dimensional needs development. Uh, we also wanted to start looking at caregivers, not only from their service perspectives, but more about maybe uh, their continued education, their um, uh, uh, work right, uh, their leisure right, uh, their rights for all different kinds of um, things that a human should, uh, should have. So because of that, we are starting our new policy initiatives. Uh, first, in the bottom there, uh, we started a 10-year initiative trying to uh, educate and bring all the companies uh, to be aware of work site um, to be caregiver friendly. Uh, so we call it workplace friendly because we want all the employers to know that at least a quarter of your employees are also a caregiver at home. So um, when they finish their work during the day and then when they go home, they become maybe a five, five hour or six hour or even 12 hour uh, care, caregivers. So uh, employers need to be aware of that and try to come up with some friendly policy or benefits for their workers. And also due to COVID-19, now I have to mention a little bit about it. Um, because uh, we rely, as you say, see earlier, that 30% of the families hire foreign workers. And because of foreign, uh, COVID-19, we were um, still steadily uh, uh, hiring immigrant, uh, Im uh, migrant, migrant workers. However, the recent increase of our um, COVID-19 pandemic numbers are all from migrant workers. Um, so uh, because of that, the government uh, sort of like paused the migrant workers uh, for a while. And that has seriously affected many families trying to hire foreign work health workers and also hospital trying to hire foreign health workers. So because of that, we are trying to put our, our no, uh, new initiatives, trying to <clears throat> 
demand the government that our universal health insurance needs to uh, increase our fee for health insurance. And we uh, everybody increase by a certain amount, a very small amount, maybe like uh, $2 of health insurance per month, uh, to US dollar per month that uh, will allow us to hire or train more domestic people to become health workers. So we don't have to rely a lot on foreign health workers. Um, and also lastly is that we try to use this, uh, this challenging time as an opportunity to <clears throat> trying to advocate for Caregiver Family Leave Act. In Taiwan, despite that we have a lot of services available and uh, creative programs, there's still not a Caregiver Family Leave Act yet. So we are trying to advocate for that. And then uh, we have come up with a uh, hundred um, wish lists of organizations collaborating together and forming alliance to um, wanting to bring our uh, agenda to the legislature this uh, next year for um, trying to pass the camp family care uh, family leave act so <clears throat> that's pretty much what i wanted to report and uh, that gives you information about how we're doing in Taiwan. Um, it's a small country. And then so um, when we have some creative programs and um, it gets done very effectively. So uh, we are very proud of our services um, as uh, same as our um, policy or what we have been doing for COVID-19. Um, we right now, uh, our life didn't change much because we didn't have to have any kind of shutdown or um, curfew or anything because um, the government was the first country, I guess, uh, started uh, wearing mandatory um, masks. So uh, everybody wear masks and, and wash uh, hands and things like that people follow up very, very well. So right now we have only like 700 people um, being diagnosed and then seven people die only. And out of the 700 who were positive, uh, 250 were from foreign workers. So we haven't had any uh, domestic cases for five months and we're trying to hold that very carefully. And uh, me being working in a hospital, uh, I really, really admire and really thankful to all the medical staff and around the world, I guess, uh, also for helping us um, trying to um, come back with this, uh, this uh, pandemic. So um, that's pretty much my report. And now uh, if you have any questions, I guess I, we, I can answer later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ko. And uh, I, I really admire all the advocacy work uh, you have been achieved, uh, in particular on the uh, uh, long-term care uh, 1.0 and 2.0, you know, how progressively um, the association can achieve um, with that. Okay, our second uh, speaker uh, is from New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, Chair of Keras New Zealand, uh, Roger Parrott. Please, Roger. Good afternoon, everybody. Looking at the time, we've got um, 30 minutes left to go between um, uh, me and Liz, so I'll, um, I'll try to speak for, for less than 15 minutes and certainly not steal any of our Australian colleagues' time. Um, we only have uh, three slides to, um, to, to work through in the presentation. If I could look at the, the first one past the heading, that would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, well, so first of all, some introductory comments about New Zealand and um, Carers New Zealand. One of the things that um, is surprising for people and which is key to our position in the world is that we are such a small country. Our population is only 5 million people, which basically makes us the size of a medium-sized city in another country. Um, this gives us advantages and disadvantages and, and interestingly, in the, the COVID situation, I think it's been a clear advantage for us. But one of the things about New Zealand as a society and a culture is that we have the aspiration to be a Scandinavian-style social support system, um, uh, you know, avowedly left-wing compared to some of the other countries in the world. 
But then we also have basically a neoliberal view of taxation and tax rates. And so there's a huge tension between our aspiration to be a, a supportive and, um, and, and uh, sort of friendly for disadvantaged people society at the same time as we don't like paying for it, um, which means that we have a whole lot of inherent tensions. So Carers New Zealand was established about 25 years ago in line with other carer organisations around the world. Um, and a lot of the themes and, um, and, and observations around carer movements and carer organisations in other countries um, very much apply to New Zealand. So our census shows that we had 430 thousand carers in New Zealand, um, a small number for another country, but that's about 16% of our population. And we have similar issues around young carers, around older carers, uh, carers struggling to stay in the workforce, even though most of them are, are, um, are workforce aged. Uh, an unusual feature in New Zealand is that we have our own unique sense of um, uh, cultural diversity with Maori and Pacifica and Asian cultures, um, uh, increasingly uh, white, what we call Pākehā New Zealanders are um, stopping into being a, a just majority and probably in, um, in my lifetime will end up being less than 50% of the population. So Carers New Zealand is a, um, the peak body for carer organisations. Um, and we have formed what we call the Carers Alliance, um, which is a collaboration of 50 specialist, often sort of illness specific um, NGOs providing support in the community that back into carer issues um, and, and rely on carers for their membership. One of the things that we're very proud of is that we have a New Zealand Carers Strategy, um, it's been called Mahi Aroha. Mahi means work and Aroha means love in Māori, so we're quite proud of that as a title, the, the, the work of love. Um, Carers New Zealand isn't a service delivery organisation, but what we do is we provide advocacy, support, um, we have an 0800 number to provide information to help people steer through our social system. Um, and then we have um, web-based social media and, and actually a, an old-fashioned printed family care magazine, which is now available online as well. So that's a bit of context about New Zealand and Carers New Zealand. Next slide, please, and we can start looking at what happened with COVID. So New Zealand... Um, the, the, the phrase that our government used was that we would go hard and go early on our lockdown. Um, and so we had a uh, one of the most severe lockdowns in the world uh, for seven weeks through March and April. Um, and, and basically um, everyone was told to stay home apart from essential workers in um, uh, the health system and the food supply system. Um, everyone else was, um, uh, was, was told not to go outdoors and, and, and to stay home. Um, and it was interesting with Grace's comments about the, um, uh, the, the contrast between a US response and a more Asian response around individualism versus collective action. New Zealand was extremely strong on, on collective action through this lockdown period. And in a, in a strange way, um, it was a unifying and quite exciting time for people to feel that they were fighting the COVID battle together. And it was a very unifying time for the country, um, uh, even though it seemed to drag on and on. And one of the things that um, was encouraging was that it was very successful. So New Zealand has had 25 deaths from COVID, um, mainly from the um, older vulnerable people. Um, uh, we've now had up to 2,000 cases 
but a third of them have all been from people who have been imported into New Zealand. And as New Zealanders returning from overseas, we've had tens of thousands of New Zealanders who have flocked home from other countries in COVID. And, uh, and they all go into a mandatory 14-day managed isolation, um, very disciplined control process. And, and we've had seven or 800 of them have actually come back into the country with COVID, but been picked up and been isolated and separated from the population. One of the consequences of the serious lockdown was there were enormous service disruptions for people who were relying on um, things like in-home carers coming and visiting. And it really meant that family carers were um, left with no support and thrown in the deep end, essentially, um, for uh, weeks and weeks and weeks. The NGOs, non-government organisations in the um, in, in civil society um, responded really strongly and all felt a huge increase in demand um, and did their best to meet that demand. One of the things that Carers New Zealand did was we worked with a, um, a food retailer and used a website we had of We Care Kiwi, which was used to um, uh, provide food parcels for family carers who couldn't get out to actually go and do their shopping and didn't have people coming in to support them. Interestingly, we felt that our government was slow to respond to carer issues, and um, we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. We think that it goes to the, um, the recognition issue, which is a huge international issue around the carer movement. Um, what happened was that the the focus on fighting the pandemic became more consuming and any secondary issues like what's happening to family carers tended to get lost. Um, and, and we were unprepared for the fact that so much pressure was going to go on to families and that they were going to have to be much more independent. Um, so, so carers themselves and family members responded to the situation and, um, and, and, and rose to the challenge, um, but at predictable and very high personal cost. And we did do a, um, an online survey amongst family carers, um, which very much confirmed that with, the, um, uh, with our stakeholders and people we spoke to. We promoted that survey to government and, um, and, and trying to get more support for the uh, for family carers. But one of the issues we had is that the, um, the government people who were responsible for responding in this kind of situation were actually subjects to the lockdown themselves and um, uh, it felt like they, you know, their system had its hands tied by itself in a, in a slightly ironic way. Um, one of the things that we are advocating for is to um, get early priority for vaccines for, um, uh, for family carers. And we've been told that the vaccines will be started to roll, be rolled out in New Zealand in 2021. Um, and we're already talking to the Ministry of Health, which is managing that process to make sure that family carers are high up on the priority list. Goodness knows what our chance of success on that will be. Then roll into the final slide, looking at the um, specific lessons that we've got from the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 experience. Really, really reinforced the need for better rec recognition and higher value for the, um, for the families. And the point that the, the news media and the almost propagandistic, jingoistic, we're all in this together fighting COVID-19, actually lost sight of all sorts of secondary issues, including family carers, and, and um, uh, emphasised for us the importance of continuing to, uh, uh, to raise that profile. We thought that the NGOs responded well, but we really didn't think that the central government was responding very well. Um, so we think, slipping down to the bottom of the slide, that there are big political and social agenda 
things that we still need to be promoting around care recognition, and essentially they're political. And they're exactly the issues that um, IACO has been talking about forever. And that um, it's just reinforced for us that there's a whole lot of work still to be done. So the last line there, kia kaha, that's Māori for be strong. Let's keep working together to help carers stay strong. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Roger. It is really amazing to see how civic uh, society can actually uh, bring power uh, back to the carers and also the community to better support uh, families who are in need. Okay, so our last uh, presenter is Lisa, Lisa Callahan uh, from uh, Carers Australia. Please, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to just go back to the previous slide, if that's okay. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, a traditional owners on the land on which I'm meeting today, which is Ngunnawal land, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all other First Nations people across the world who have taken on caring roles during um, this very challenging time. I'm really excited to be here as well, and I've really enjoyed all of the presentations uh, this morning. It's, it's sort of lunchtime here in Australia now. Um, I will... Uh, be as, as quick as I can as well. Um, I think the presentation I'm going to go through is really just going to focus on uh, our experience of COVID. And um, our first case was recorded in January uh, this year. And um, we very quickly went into lockdown at that time as well with travel restrictions and prohibition of social gatherings and social distancing, uh, et cetera. Um, there was, we're very lucky, and, and listening to everyone, I just want to acknowledge we're in a very different situation to most other countries in the world, and we do all feel very uh, grateful for that on a daily basis, and also acknowledge that our experiences are, are definitely not the same as everyone else's experiences. So uh, hopefully what I, what I am going to share with you is, is helpful in some way, but just acknowledging uh, it, it's very different experience. So we had increased government financial support um, began to be offered at the beginning of the year uh, for unemployed people and people who lost their jobs. And employers were really keen to keep people employed during um, uh, the lockdown and government supported uh, workers in order to do that. Um, and I think the measures proved to be quite effective in containing the spread of the virus. And after a peak in April, um, there was a large decline in cases between May and June. So we've had um, around 28,000 cases, 908 um, deaths. Uh, and we just have um, one of our states and territories went through a very long 100 day lockdown. Uh, they had a, a kind of a second wave, but that's all contained. So we have almost no community, well, no community transition transmission apart from yesterday. So that's interesting, but I think we've learnt um, some lessons and uh, very quickly government sort of jumps on, on all of that. If I can go to the first slide, please. So um, while we've all experienced uh, in Australia some negative consequences, the impact on carers uh, and those they care for, like all of you, uh, it's been particularly <laughs> pronounced. And I guess the major broad negative impacts on carers um, were revealed by surveys. So we conducted a number of surveys during the year. And we know that there's been markedly higher levels of anxiety uh, arising from the vulnerability of people uh, who are being cared for to the, the worst outcomes of disease. So we often talk about carers have sheltered at home and looked after the most vulnerable. And I think people have been worried about what would happen to the people they care for um, if they themselves became infected and, and who would look after them. I think there was, uh, during the lockdown, a loss, a loss of support services like um, others have described that this morning, particularly for older people and people living with a disability. 
and um, I think there was a loss of access to carer support workers and allied health professionals as well, where they were unwilling to provide face-to-face -face services um, or carers themselves were actually unwilling to have people come into their homes. And so there's been markedly increased social isolation arising from that sort of hypervigilance in avoiding all contact with others, including families and friends. It turns out Australia is quite good at following rules. So when we're told to lock down and wear masks and all those sorts of things, we're very, very compliant, which uh, was a bit of a surprise to me. So it's a, it's a good surprise, I guess. Uh, there was a loss of employment, as I said before, um, hours of employment were reduced, but the government su have supported um, people with additional sort of payments, which I'll go into later. But with the lockdowns, there has been rising costs of essential goods um, and problems accessing essentials such as groceries and medication and um, public transport. So we did a survey of carers in April and May where 81% of respondents said their mental health had deteriorated since the COVID-19 pandemic and 88% had experienced increased stress in their role as a carer. Not very surprising statistics. And in describing their feelings, I think respondents reported fear, anxiety, stress, depression, fatigue, boredom and uh, loneliness. Thanks, Charlotte, next slide. So that's just um, uh, a timeline of the cases. Um, so I think we could go to the, I think there's another slide, Charlotte, there. Um, so on the latest estimates, Australia's unpaid family and friend carers contribute 2.2 billion hours of care annually and the cost of replacing them with paid care would be 70, almost $78 billion, that's Australian dollars. Um, we, we have about 2.8 million unpaid carers in Australia. So it's widely recognised by government that without these carers, the cost of providing adequate aged care and disability support care, um, et cetera, would be unaffordable. And yet um, it's probably fair to say carers, like everyone else has expressed and experienced, um, and Roger was just saying that carers have been provided with very little additional support during the pandemic. Um, for example, despite the fact that, that the federal government and state governments provided detailed and continually updated information to the general public, there wasn't um, any carer specific information. We're now getting that just now, but it's, it's sort of, it's a bit late, um, but they are looking at that now. Carers had no priority access to PPE or COVID testing, although COVID testing has been widely available. There has been large increases in fortnightly payments um, to other welfare recipients that were introduced, but we had to fight very hard to get an additional two um, payments for carers that were already receiving carer payments. So we were quite disappointed with that. So no additional funding was provided um, uh, to carers um, sort of um, during the, the lockdown that we we're aware of. So while priority access to shopping, which included special shopping hours and home delivery services uh, for, for many essential workers um, and um, people with disability or older people, there was little recognition um, that in many cases carers actually had to do this shopping for those people and so many struggled to establish their right to, to get access to the early shopping on behalf of those um, that they cared for. Thanks, next slide. So on the positive side though, um, there, what, we, what we know there was a necessity to rapidly introduce new ways of providing services and supports during the pandemic. And so there's been quite a bit of reform in that area and change. And we think that that will remain in the future. So for example, a very common problem for carers, um, particularly carers of older people or people living with a disability has been the additional effort of attending face-to-face -face medical appointments for themselves or for those they care for. And home visits aren't really um, something that happens very often in Australia and they're, they're very expensive. 
So um, there was, you know, also concern about um, attending medical practices as a source of infection and all that sort of stuff. So the government introduced telehealth consultation, which I think um, consumers and various groups have been calling for for, you know, many, many, many years. Uh, that's now in place and we think that that probably um, uh, won't change, which is a good thing. Um, there's going to be some continuing research and analysis of what's gone wrong for carers and those they care for during the pandemic and some of the research that's been undertaken um, sort of are highlighting the existing flaws in service adaptation or service provision. Um, so I think um, many services have moved to online platforms um, and that helps to address some of the difficulties faced by many carers who are largely housebound due to their caring duties. And it's also highlighted the importance of ensuring that carers have access to equipment and knowledge they need. And I guess finally, the pivotal role that carers have played in providing support when um, many other forms of support have suddenly become unavailable provides us people like uh, Peak Body Like Carers Australia with um, additional opportunity to advocate and highlight um, uh, the essential role of carers and their need for better recognition and support. Uh, we have not received a confirmation that carers will be on the priority list for our vaccine, um, but we have written to the um, uh, health minister and asked to go on that list. Um, yeah, we're not we're not sure how that will happen, uh, whether that will happen, but um, we're hopeful and. We're also not in a huge hurry to get the vaccine. Uh, we're looking at rolling it out in March, but I also think um, uh, we're sort of sitting back and taking taking our time a little bit and having a look um, and seeing how things play out elsewhere. So we do indeed feel very lucky and um, we also feel um, a lot of empathy and a lot of support for all of our fellow carers across the world who are, you know, really doing it hard. So that, um, thank you for the opportunity. I hope that's been useful. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cole and uh, Roger and the leads. Um, I really um, learned a lot and I do uh, observe that uh, under this session, uh, in particular, it seems like that we are uh, discussing or sharing in scenario uh, that how caregiver support uh, can be um, uh, sit in the context that we are talking about the relationship with family, community, uh, the market, uh, for example, the domestic helpers and the government. So I think uh, when we are talking about uh, family caregiver or caregiver support, we're always situated in this kind of um, relationship uh, what are the key relationships uh, in terms of this and uh, um, let me see if there's any uh, specific uh, questions uh, from the both of the chat room no uh, if not um, I would like to uh, ask a question on that so in, in your view uh, what what are the uh, if, if COVID-19 is kind of alarm uh, for all of us, uh, no matter where we are all over the world, to rethink about the relationship between family, the market, and the, the community, and the government uh, in terms of taking care of uh, who are really in need, uh, who cannot um, uh, live independently in the community. Uh, what would be the next step? I mean, to actually uh, whether it is very important to um, legalize the relationship or whether it is more important to uh, lose a little bit of the uh, work culture or uh, what, what are the key uh, issues uh, if we're looking forward in the future uh, 10 or 20 years of time. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Ko, please. Okay, um, I think um, this pandemic has uh, really sort of um, alarmed us to think about how to best uh, enhance everybody's capacity while being very passionate or, uh, or uh, very sympathize uh, the, the situation that caregivers are in. So 
people, in addition to maybe digital, you know, or technological care, uh, people are starting to form uh, sort of like self-help groups. Um, some rural cities, they have started um, something like share work. So maybe like, um, for instance, like if we live close to each other, we are both caregivers. And then, so we share our caregiving loads together. So they are sort of like collaborating um, and then sort of like taking terms and then they, they all embrace all their care recipients and together and then they take, take turns. And so we're basically sharing our uh, the caregiving load and also maybe some started, uh, for instance, uh, time banks and things like that. Uh, the time banks to help people, young people who have some maybe like after school or uh, holidays, they can care for older adults in exchange for um, other things that um, they can probably um, cash out later. So this kind of co-sharing intergenerationally or among neighbors, um, that's a beauty of what I see, a very positive side of, uh, of uh, pandemics uh, as a result, so. Thank you. Yes, I, oh, sorry. I, I would just uh, support that, those comments. And uh, I think the other thing that has happened is uh, an acknowledgement that flexible working is really um, uh, yes. here to stay. So being able to work from home, if you're able to, and um, working flexibly, different hours. If you have that type of uh, job, that really does help with the caregiving role uh, as well. And I think that flexibility won't disappear. And I think that's a good thing. It's a very good point about the flexibility yeah. of work that, uh, that Liz was making. And we're very much seeing that as well. One of the, the things that um, has happened in our country is that the idea of being kind has become a mantra. <clears throat> to have politicians standing up and saying, we all have to be kind to each other during this difficult time is something that we had never experienced before. And it feels like a, um, a, a shift in mindset. And uh, uh, Carers New Zealand and other um, health and disability type NGOs are looking at that and saying, well, what about being kind to us? And is this actually creating some momentum and something that we could plug into and, um, and, and, and ride along? It's all very well to say be kind, but actually be recognized would be good as well. And if you're recognized, then being kind would be really good for family carers. Um, if, if, if the society was kinder to them and, and, and the difficulties they place. Face. So, so we see it as an opportunity and one that um, uh, we're going to try and shamelessly um, take advantage of. If I can just share a question from the chat that I think um, is an interesting perspective to leave off on. Um, so the question is um, from someone on Facebook and, the, and they shared, as an American who has lost many friends and members of his family, I'm always curious to find out what other countries think of our, th this person says failure, I would say sort of our, the American response to COVID-19 and, and sort of how it's become politicized. Um, this person shares that they've been a caregiver for 62 years since they were 10 years old. So they're wondering how do others view um, the caregiving experience when they look at the US, and, and I would also say broadly, are there things that when you look at other nations, you think the, these are common threads that we share regardless of what country we're living in? Brave to expect any of us to skip an answer there, Grace. Anyway, I'll have a go. Um, one of the things for Actually, and you see it in IACO when you look at the range of countries that are represented, and then we have conversations with um, with you and, and and other people from the US, and the um, the individualism in the United States is both uh, a key attribute for what's made it the country that it is, 
but in situations like this, you can also see that it's a weakness. And, and the, the sense of very strong individualism, I think, is, um, is, is unique in the US. I think that um, there are elements of it in the current government in the UK as well. And the rest of the world looking in doesn't think that the difficulties that you're having are unconnected to that. And the other thing that is um, uh, kind of seems obvious from the outside is the um, social inequality and the effects on COVID amongst different classes of people within the United States. And the fact that it's the people at the bottom of the heap who are really, really doing it hard. And if you've got the luxury to be able to self-isolate and look after yourself, um, then people in the United States actually are doing all right. And that inequality is something that's also quite glaring to people from the outside, I think. Hopefully that's not too provocative. I think that's helpful. And any Vivian, I don't know if you have any perspectives or Liz or Sue Ann. Yeah, I I I do uh uh I do uh, reflect on a lot uh, during my years of uh, studying caregivers uh, in Hong Kong and also uh, in mainland China. I, I do uh, reflect on you know how uh, the cultural context or social expectations on families would have an impact. I think uh, uh, Dr. Ko uh, uh, has mentioned this uh, in Taiwan as well. So we uh, in in our Asia. Uh, Pacific places, uh, maybe uh, it, it would be an, a nice time for us to further reflect on uh, the cultural uh, expectations and our uh, family values, and uh, in particular, uh, Roger mentioned be kind, and also uh, Liz uh, mentioned you know how the neighborhood can be uh, motivated um, in this kind of crisis, uh, so that we can find out more proactive. Um, solutions um, to better support the carers, um, not only uh, in their um, experience uh, in their crisis stage, but also in different stages, as Dr. Ko has mentioned, uh, pre care the new carers, the, the experienced one, uh, and also the, the, the graduated. So uh, this could be something that uh, maybe we can bring uh, to the international scene, uh, so that uh, more uh, can be shared, uh, not only the common theme, but also the, um, the vision uh, of the Alliance to uh, reach uh, in the coming future. Um, I'm quite aware of the time. Maybe I just uh, pass the time uh, back to Grace. Thank you. Vivian, thank you so much, and Liz and Roger and Sue Ann for um, for being here. I, I, what a wonderful session! I think to close out this this ongoing global conversation. So I want to thank all of you for taking your time this morning um, and for being a part of this important conversation and for the work that you do for carers um, every day. So. I'm going to close us out on the end of our days of presentations. And I'll note a couple of things for those of you who are listening in or who may be following us on Facebook or other online platforms. I think the first is one of the lessons that we can take away from this week is just all of the things that we share as a global community and the opportunity to learn from our colleagues. These materials, um, including the presentations and the recordings for these videos will be made available online on caregiving.org. And we will also share information about the Embracing Carers Initiative, including the new COVID-19 um, Carer Wellbeing Study that Jasmine referenced at the top of today's discussion. We will share, uh, in addition to that, other international surveys that we have discovered related to COVID-19. And on Friday, we'll have a global meeting, um, a town hall, where we will actually look at the pressure points facing carers in this crisis so that we can be better prepared for the next crisis. We're so thankful that all of you could join us, that you could help us stay engaged on this conversation. And we welcome your continued engagement 
um, please accept our gratitude for the wonderful work you're doing uh, to take care of others and to make the world a kinder, more caring place. So with that, I will then close the meeting. I wish all of you a very happy holiday season for those of you who are celebrating upcoming holidays. And again, our gratitude for being here with us and spending this time together. Thank you very much and have a lovely rest of your week.